Hello, and welcome to this NJCU Center for the Arts Digital event. We would like to ask everyone to please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the program, and we will only be accepting questions and comments via the chat window. At the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, or possibly the top right if you are on a different device, you should be able to see an option for chat. If you click that, it will open the chat window where you can type your questions so that they may be read aloud and answered. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Please note, the views and opinions expressed in this virtual event and presentation are solely those of the individual artists in their personal capacity and are not reflective of nor represent official policy, position, or views of New Jersey City University. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our creative process series. I'm Stephanie Chaikin. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts at NJCU. And we are delighted to have you with us this evening. We have an amazing program, The Roads to Publishing, a conversation with three NJCU graduates, um, Chloe DeFilippis, Angel Eduardo, and Natasha Persaud. And we're going to have a moderated by Dr. Edvige Junta. Uh, Dr. Junta is an award-winning educator as well as an acclaimed writer and editor. Among others, her books include Teaching Italian American Literature, Film, and Popular Culture, and Personal Effects, Essays on Memoir, Teaching, and Culture in the World of Louise de Salvo. Dr. Junta was awarded the OSIA Book Club Selection for Italian American Writers on New Jersey and the Educator of the Year Award for the Higher Education category from the Association of Italian American Educators, among others. Um, Edvige has been bringing us these amazing, super insightful conversations that have been delving into what inspires writers to create their work. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Edvige Junta. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and uh, thank you again for uh, um, opening this uh, uh, space uh, for these uh, conversations uh, and uh, enabling us uh, to come together as, uh, as a community, even in uh, these very complicated times and circumstances. Um, so we're getting close to the end of uh, the semester. This is our last uh, writers event. Uh, we've, been, we've been so lucky to have some very exciting writers uh, uh, come and share um, with you their work, their insights. Uh, and for me, as a, as a teacher of creative writing, it's especially important uh, um, because it allows me to share with my current students uh, um, a, a sense of the possibilities, uh, what is what can, they can do um, in the future past uh, the creative writing classroom, which, as I told the students uh, um, recently, is just a class. Uh, by class can be um, um, a space where incredible things can happen and sometimes you can get the first glimpse uh, into the future that, that, that you want to pursue um, as a writer. So in uh, thinking of this event, I wanted to, I was thinking of a, a, a few things. First of all, three writers uh, um, I love, uh, I have had the privilege to work with each of them and they are part of the the a supportive, rich writing community here at NGSU and they've been for years. And so just the sharing their work, my students have also read their work this semester. So this is particularly exciting for them. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about what it means to be a writer in terms of the work of writing and the work of supporting yourself through writing. Um, writing is work, it's not a hobby. Um, if you're a writer, you probably received uh, letters of people asking you to read uh, a 300 page manuscript on, during your free time. Well, writers don't have free time. Writers actually have very little time. Time is our most precious asset. So these three writers have found a way of uh, working on the writing and also finding jobs uh, that are related to writing. So I wanted them to share the experience and also to open up for um, current uh, students who are majoring in English or creative writing, 
some of the professional opportunities are out there and how to go about them. Um, very often, English majors will pursue teaching as a career. And as I've said many times, I am devoted to teaching. I cannot see myself doing anything else. But teaching is not a career that everyone who has studied literature and writing needs to pursue. There are other careers out there. And so I'm hoping that we can talk about the careers that each of them has been pursuing or is planning um, on pursuing and, and still exploring. So we will talk about all aspects of writing from the work that goes into getting to your desk, the projects that you're working on, the profession you're ri of writing and much more. I want to invite everyone to post your questions on, on chat and start doing it even now. Um, I will ask um, um, a few questions and we'll try to have as fluid a conversation uh, um, as we can. And I would like actually, instead of uh, um, doing my usual introductions, I would like each of our uh, um, three writers uh, um, to tell us a little bit about themselves. And I am surprising them with this. I didn't even warn them. Um, do tell us when you graduated from NJCU, if you remember, I hope you do. Um, and um, what you majored in, what you did in school, um, who you are as a writer, just very briefly, and, and what you're doing right now. Um, so why don't we start with Chloe? Sure thing. So hi, I'm Chloe DeFilippis. Uh, I graduated from NJCU in January 2015. I was an English major and my concentration uh, was in creative writing. I studied under Eddie for most of my time at NJCU um, and I completed my honors thesis and memoir. I also um, worked for the journal Transformations, um, which was really helpful in getting uh, a jump start in my career in publishing. So I worked in at uh, Simon and Schuster and Fiden, two publishing um, houses in uh, New York City, one much bigger, that's Simon and Schuster, and then one much smaller, that's Fiden. And I worked in sales there. And then recently, in January of 2020, I uh, joined the MPD group, uh, working for their books team. Uh, we are um, the tool we use is called BookScan, and it's one of the it's like the number one tool that publishers use to track book sales. Thank you, Chloe. Natasha. Okay, so I'm Natasha Prasad, and I graduated from NJCU, I believe, in 2015. Uh, my major was journalism with a concentration in creative nonfiction. Right now, I am pursuing a second master's degree in clinical and mental health uh, therapy from New Jersey City University. And I am working as a writer in the communications department at John Jay College. Thank you. Angel? Hi, everybody. I'm Angel Eduardo, and I did five and a half years at NJCU. I graduated in 2008, and that last semester was the semester where I became a writing, creative writing minor. I was a psychology major the entire time up until that. I don't know what I was thinking. Nobody else does. But um, that last semester, I took Eddie's memoir class, and that was that was it for me. Um, so ever since then, I've been writing on and off on my own. And just recently, in the last couple of years, uh, April 2018, I started working for Idealist.org, which is a nonprofit job board mostly, but they also have um, a number of blogs. And uh, I was hired to write stories about good people doing good things in the world. So I am now an actual employed writer. Congratulations. Well, thank you these, uh, for, for sharing these, um, um, these details about where you come from and where you are right now. And we'll find out more during our conversations. So I wanted to ask each of you, um, well, thank you, Angel, for crediting the memoir workshop and it has been such a pleasure to, to work with each of you and, and to see you just really um, grow into these very, very um, compelling writers. And I love your writing so much that I decide to teach it. So when the moment when you become decide that you are, you are a writer, I don't know if you become a writer or you're a writer, I guess the experience can be very different. There is a, 
for everyone. And yes, we can credit classes that we've taken, mentors, a book. But at some point, there is an internal moment, a moment of self-confrontation where you recognize, yeah, well, I have a right. I almost don't have a choice. I have to write. So I was wondering if each of you um, feel there has been such a moment in your writing journey or if it has been a kind of organic process and all of a sudden you have found yourself in the midst of it. You know, I think I've always been writing. Um, I grew up writing, even I think, you know, Eddie, in your class, I, my, one of the first pieces I wrote, I wrote about not actually knowing how to write, but just scribbling words on a paper when I was younger. But I think for me, um, I didn't really have a voice growing up and I didn't really have a space to feel comfortable. And on the paper is where I felt comfortable. It was where I could actually write. And I didn't know that that was something that you could do professionally until, you know, I got to NJCU and I joined the journalism department. And then James Broderick, who's here, was my advisor. And he was like, you need to take Eddie's class. And I came into your class and I know it sounds, you know, a little cliche to say that. I really found that writing about myself and my family, like that's the moment when I realized that, you know, I was a writer and it was a journey, you know, it wasn't an instantaneous thing, but I think that really is like the central moment for me where you said it, you have a story and you have a right to tell that story. And it was so important to hear that. And I think with hearing that it kickstarted this whole journey to writing, but it was a really, you know, foundational moment for me, I think on my journey. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned, Natasha, about the scribbling, because my mom used to do, she was in college when I was really young, and she used to do her homework at the kitchen table when I was supposed to be sleeping. And I would, I would see her scribbling, handwriting, you know, her homework, and I would just copy her. I would just take loose leaf paper and fill it with scribbles that, you know, my attempt at cursive. And um, yeah, I've just, I never became a writer. I, I discovered that I was a writer, I think, at some point. And, uh, you know, I had teachers tell me that I was a writer. I, I had teachers tell me, they'd give me extra work. They would give me these workbooks, like storytelling workbooks, narrative workbooks, and say, fill this up, keep doing this. Um, and I, I loved doing it. I've, I've always wanted to be a creative. I've always wanted to be a storyteller of some kind. So I tried a bunch of different avenues. And, um, but yeah, like, just like Natasha said, I never thought about it being a career. It never occurred to me for some reason until um, my second to last semester at NJCU <laughs> when I, I was taking Chris Westman's uh, creative writing class. And I just mentioned to him offhand, I said, you know, this is the only class that I actually look forward to. I, I really enjoy this. And I, it's the only one that I wake up every Wednesday or whatever it was. Um, and I'm excited to drive over here. And he said, well, that should tell you something. And that's the moment where I was, I, I realized, oh, I can, I can actually do this. This is a thing that people do. It never occurred to me for some reason, even though I read all these books that the people who wrote them, that's their job. Um, but yeah, I've been, I feel like I've been on a crash course, a collision course towards this since, since the very, very beginning. I just, I'm the last person to have realized it. <laughs> Thank you, Angel, and thank you for, um, for um, mentioning uh, Chris Westman, uh, beloved uh, colleague and teacher who has uh, inspired uh, so many students and all of us miss terribly, really uh, a truly exceptional uh, um, teacher and, and, and person who has, uh, who has really left a great legacy um, here at NGCU. Chloe, do you want to... Yeah, sure. So it's funny, um, we were all scribblers because I did the same thing uh, when I was young too. I'd find books and, and scribble in them. Um, so it's always been something that I've been attached to and gravitated towards. Um, and I was lucky enough too to have teachers throughout my life who, who told me, oh, you need to keep pursuing this. Um, as for, I think I always knew it was possible to have a career as a, a writer. I just didn't know how to have a career as a writer. And I think that's something that um, people do have to teach you. Um, I, I think you can learn it on your own, but I think having a community and having a good, um, 
having good people around you to tell you, okay, well, this is what you need to do to become a writer and to be a writer as a, as your job. Um, that's something that's definitely, um, you know, found. Um, but writing as itself, I, I, I think I, just like Natasha and Angel, it was, it was from the very beginning. So this is quite remarkable how the sense of, uh, of uh, the urgency or the, the need for writing uh, is something that you recognize as always having been with you, but there, are, there is a shift in recognizing that there is something else, that there is the writing, the scribbling, and then the, the writing that makes you a writer as in the profession uh, um, of writer. And I would like to go back uh, to the issue, and perhaps there are even some questions about that, uh, um, but I thought our audience uh, would love to hear um, just a snippet of your writing uh, from each of you so we get to hear um, your voices. So shall we start uh, with you, Chloe? Sure thing. Um, are we still doing three minutes? Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. So um, this is from uh, the memoir that, um, short memoir that Eddie is teaching in her class. It's called um, Next Time I'll Show You How. And this is an excerpt from it. So on weekends, Damien's parents barely moved from the beige leather sectional in the living room, a wide open white walled space that also serves as the dining room. Sprawled out on the couch, his squat father takes the longer section, his lean mother the smaller, she in a terry cloth pajama set, magenta spaghetti strap shirt veiling her small breasts, matching magenta short shorts just covering her ass. He in a white undershirt and over the knee navy blue gym shorts, both barefoot, his mother's toes lacquered burgundy, a scorpion tattooed on his father's left foot. On the large glass table before them sits their essentials, two packs of marble lights, two Bic lighters, and two ashtrays. They drink from tumbler glasses filled with vodka, maybe whiskey, green bottled Heineken sweating on coasters. They don't have to get up. All they have to do is reach over. Nothing can tear them away from the couch, not even knowing that their teenage son is shut in his bedroom with his girlfriend. Cackles and screeches, the same noises that send my father thumping down the stairs do not rouse them. Long periods of silence do not unnerve them. They don't pop in just to check like my mother does when Damien comes to my house. Instead, they watch television, news, game shows, singing competitions. Drifting in and out of sleep, they seem to keep the same channel on all day, no matter what show is airing. The volume never lowers. Polish blares throughout the apartment, quick, husky, guttural. Some people think that if you are smothered by a language, you are bound to learn it. My Polish-American mother is one of those people. So was I for a little while. I live amongst the ghosts of my mother's family. I grew up in her childhood home. Back in those days, my mother says, the Irish hated us. Being the only Polish family on an Irish block, can you imagine? It didn't help that my father was difficult, a very stubborn man. It's a shame you never got to meet him, Damien. Maybe listening to you would have jogged his memory. Maybe he would have remembered Polish again. My mother adores Damien through this language alone. He's true Polish, born in the motherland with the mother tongue. She tells him what her children are tired of hearing, monologues about growing up with a depression era mother, a hardworking yet absentee father. She asks Damien to speak to her, yearning for Polish's sticky kiss, like the ones her bop she gave her, the grandmother she ran to during her mother's episodes of unprovoked anger and silence treatments. Sabina often said to my mother, who are you? You're not my little girl. But Bob, she knew her daughter's cruelty. She took my mother in on the days and nights Sabina did not want her, the last immigrant of their family. Bob, she scattered her thick accented English sentences with Polish words, words my mother longed to hear since her grandmother's death. You're just so fluent, she gushes to Damien. Nah, my Polish is terrible, Damien waves a hand at her. My family makes fun of me. Oh no, it's beautiful. I would kill to know half of what you do. Some days I feel replaced. My mother becomes the girlfriend. In the kitchen where these conversations happen, I lean against the door frame of the room I share with my older sister. I pick at the white paint, the cracked chunks, a reminder of my, when my father tried to break the door down after I fell asleep with it locked and my family assumed I was dead. Maybe I'm the ghost. I feel vaporous enough to be one. A seventh grade girl, I seem invisible. 
Thank you, Chloe. And um, I did teach this in, uh, um, in my memoir class. I should have included in my also dark stories for young adults uh, next time. And this was published uh, in Ovunque Siamo, right? Uh, which is uh, um, um, a magazine, a literary magazine of Italian American writing. Ovunque Siamo means uh, wherever we are. And here we are. Um, Angel, uh, what will you read? And can you tell us also where the piece was published? Sure. Uh, this piece is called Go, and it was published in the Caribbean Writer about five years ago. Um, it's a pretty short piece and uh, pretty self-explanatory. So, Lemuel, te voy a decir una cosa. My father pauses, guiding his gold Cadillac de Ville up the ramp towards the George Washington Bridge. I shift my legs in the back seat, absorbing the warmth trapped in the car's beige leather, waiting for him to continue. Through the window, I see the amber glow of apartment buildings dissolving into the cool darkness over the Hudson River. We're leaving Washington Heights, the Dominican neighborhood where my father has his dental lab and where we used to live. Our apartment was a tiny one, just above where my father worked. It used to be that he'd walk up two flights of stairs to get to our front door. Now he drives over the river to Fort Lee, New Jersey, where he and my mother bought a house. Lemuel, he jabs. Dime, I answer. Tiene que hacer bien en la escuela. School, he says. Do well, he says. I knew it. I haven't been doing well. Ever since starting school in Jersey in the third grade, I've hated it more and more. I don't fit in, people don't like me, I'm ignored. It's only gotten worse in the two years I've been there. My grades are dropping and I never do my homework. I feel like school is a waste of my time my time to play and create, my time to enjoy myself. I don't know what to say, so I keep quiet. My father continues. Tiene que trabajar duro. Work, work hard. I know what's coming next. I've heard it all so many times before. Somewhere in the Dominican Republic when my father was my age, his father died. His mother abandoned him. He was alone and penniless and had to work tirelessly to put food in his mouth and clothes on his back. No one ever gave him a thing. He has traded time and sweat for all he's ever gotten. My father worked his way through school and university, eventually graduating with his degree in dentistry. He met and married my mother and chose to start a family, but not before uprooting to the, to the United States and leaving everything he had behind, including his doctorate. My father started from square one again, learning English and going back to school for a dental technician's license. A quicker route in the dental school, and a quicker means for earning a living to keep food on the table for us. Tiene que sacar A en todo para que pueda ir a la universidad. Straight A's, college. What am I supposed to say to that? I'm in fifth grade. I glance out the window as we cross the halfway point on the bridge. I'm always intrigued by the sign saying, welcome to New Jersey, and how close it is to the sign saying, welcome to New York, facing the other direction. Every time I wait to feel something as we pass over the border. I picture the jagged line cutting the two land masses apart, splitting them into distinct places with different cultures and accents, different day-to-day -day lives, different people. And I wonder if I should feel different, but no, it's always the same nothing crossing from one state to the next. I just don't get it. Thank you so much. Uh, this is such um, an intense piece that speaks to the, to the tension uh, in, uh, you know, which is, the tension between parents and children uh, that is, uh, is uh, so powerfully felt uh, um, in immigrant families where there is the powerful transition and, and the aspiration must be often realized by the children. Thank you so much, uh, Angel. Uh, Natasha, and again, if you can tell us the title of the piece and what it was published. So the title of this piece is Dear Girl and it was published in Gay Magazine. A Guyanese family begins and ends with a mother, tenement yard mother, coolie mother, negro mother, mother who cooks, mother who cleans, mother who bathes her brown little children. She lathers their hair with a cake of blue soap, fingernails digging into scalp, scrubbing away days of light, sun, and dirt. Mother never recoils. Her children can never be so dirty in her eyes. Mother empties the posies of worms that pass through their infected bodies. She says, bend yourself, as she cleans them, so that their hands never touch their body's own waste. 
under the wire lines with sweat trailing down temples, teeth biting down on plastic clothes clips and bleach wrinkling her fingertips. Mother bows and stands against the land, hanging clothes day after day. Her voice is sugar sweet on quiet days. Mother sings here on Bass, Market Woman, Shatira, and Janie Girl. But when you are far, her voice cracks the shells of the tamarinds hanging on the tree. Mother becomes violent. You cry from the sting of her hands until you sleep, a sound, dreamless sleep. Is Fionn good, she says. Everything a mother does is for her children's own good. You've seen a mother slap her children. You've seen a mother burn their skin. She says they never learn. Why don't they learn? Stop crying, running, and calling after her, tenement mother scream. All mothers tell girls that men only want one thing. It's your fault when you give it, girl. It's your fault when they take it. One little girl never told her mother about that young man that one little girl never told her mother about that young man that called her boy in dark corners after he and that long, dark, strange part released white snot onto her thighs. She hates the skin there the most. Mothers tell little girls, don't ever talk about boys. Don't ever the say the word vagina or pat a cake. It's not a nursery rhyme here. It's another name for that thing between your legs. The girls who want to know things are fast. We heard of that kind of girl. Five boys rape that kind of girl. Years after, they still say, she looked fit. What was she doing out in the road at that time, nine at night? The first boy that raped, she was bad, yes, but all of them boys that went one right after the other was nasty, pure nastiness in the same hole. All the mothers shake their heads. No good can come from roads, they tell little girls. You never tell anyone about the neighborhood man that invites you at eight years old to see his baby kittens that he touched you, that he wrapped a towel around his naked waist and hummed you moaning and groaning until his body was a dead weight upon yours, until his breath went quiet in your hear ear and he whispered tiredly, don't move girl, you hear? You ran, why did you go there girl? He looked down from that doorway and smiled at your retreating body. He never told you to keep quiet, he didn't have to. Thank you, Natasha. And one of the first comments that appeared on chat was uh, so lyrical, and that is definitely the perfect uh, word uh, to, to describe uh, um, your writing. And I would like, you know, if there is time, I have uh, more questions to ask you, but there are some questions that have already been posted, and I would like uh, to give our audience an opportunity um, to hear your answers. So, so I'm going to turn to Donia, who has very graciously agreed to work with us and uh, read through the question and, and select the questions that can be of greater interest uh, to everyone. So Donia, do you have some questions for us? Yes, I do. Um, I'd like to start with Professor James Broderick's question. I feel it's a very fitting start because many people outside of the English department don't really know what it means to be a writer, even though they themselves are writers, but they don't think they're writers, you know? So the question is, where do you stand on the idea that writers are born, not made? Do you agree with that statement or disagree with it? I want to agree with it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take the stance that writers can be made. I think um, there's a lot of people who really don't consider themselves writers. And when I was teaching with the Writer's Circle of New Jersey, one of the things that I learned was, you know, that a lot of people come in with a lot of hesitation about classifying themselves as a writer, and they have a really simple definition that I think is really wonderful, which is that anyone who writes and does the work that goes into writing is a writer, but there's a difference between a published writer and author versus someone who is, you know, writing. So I think if you're doing the work, you're writing and, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that you had to be born to be a writer. You know, there are people who have discovered writing at later parts of their lives. And, you know, I just, I think it's really a, a creative form for healing and expression that's open to everyone who's willing to take a shot and do it because there are a lot of great writers who never thought that they would be writers and they picked up a pen and did the work and turns out they're amazing at it. I agree. Um... One thing that, that came to mind right away when you asked that question was in uh, Dr. Westman's class, there was a student there who was taking it as an elective just to fulfill one of the area requirements. 
and he would often show up to class in his baseball uniform. He was an athlete. So he's completely on the, you know, the other end of the spectrum as far as he's concerned. And he, you know, he didn't think himself a writer at all, but he did the assignments and he would read the stories out loud. And I remember them still. Um, it's been 12 years. And I still remember the things that he wrote and how they affected me. And he's, he was so unassuming and he was so, you know, he really didn't think that what he was doing with was that was worth anything, was worth anybody's time, but it was the most beautiful writing. So, I mean, you can say that he was born with that and that it, it was just coaxed out of him by Dr. Westman, but um, I don't think it matters. I think what matters is if you are, if you are writing, I don't, it doesn't matter if you were born a writer or if you are a writer, it matters if you are writing. And if you're writing, you're a writer, you're in the club. It's all good. Yeah, I, I have to say not to, I guess not to be aggressive, but I always hate quotes like that. <laughs> um, they just, I don't know what it is. Something about them always rubs me the wrong way, maybe because they sound aggressive to me. Um, I, I think any creative pursuit, it's not whether you're born or made. I think it's whether you pursue it um, and on your own terms. That, that's how I've always viewed anything creative, whether it's writing or drawing or singing or, um, you know, sewing. It, it, it's, I don't think it has much to do with, um, you know, nature or nurture or anything like that. I, I think it's, it's all about the pursuit. Um, so that's my thought. <laughs> all wonderful thoughts. Um, our next question is more so, more so towards the publishing process. Um, uh, the question is from Michelle. When you started thinking of publishing, did it impact what you wanted to write about? Did you ever have a fear of publishing a certain piece? Have you overcome that fear? And how if you did? Um, I've had a lot of fear about publishing memoir, uh, mostly from a, from my, um, mostly because of, of my subject matter that I often write about. Um, so in that, in that sense, I am pickier about where I would, um, publish certain pieces. And I, I think that's really a part of that you have to think about is, is where you're going to publish. So, um, for me, kind of the more niche, lesser known avenues is always, has always been my preference because of that. Um, and also because it's a good, I think, um, stepping stone. Um, because, you know, it's like having your reach school <laughs> and your, your target school. You know, you have to have different options for different pieces. Um, I will say that every time I've tried to write a piece for a publication, I've always um, failed. <laughs> something about that pressure I can't it's just I can't handle it and um it's always usually after like the date that it needs to be in that I will actually be able to sit down and write um whatever the prompt might have been um so yeah use them as prompts maybe but don't go out there thinking you're gonna get it in the way you want it to on time <laughs> that's hilarious uh <laughs> I um, I went through a long period where I was just trying to get published. So I, I had a bunch of stuff, a bunch of pieces just piled up and I was just submitting them, submitting them anywhere that I heard about, you know, I, if I saw a friend of mine would publish something somewhere, I would check out the website, see what their submission guidelines are and just send them something. If I had something that made sense. Um, and, you know, a lot of times they recommend you know, submitting to places where you read. So if you frequent a, a, a particular website or if you, if you read a particular magazine or journal or something, you're more likely to understand the type of thing that they're looking for. And you can write to that if you want to. That never worked for me. Um, kind of like what Chloe was saying, like is the muse just decides I'm not gonna help you. Um, because you're trying to do it this way. So for me, it has to come organically. I have to write it because I want to, and then I find a place for it to fit. And sometimes that takes a really long time. I have two pieces 
that I can think of right now that I wrote while I was in grad school. And I really, really like both of them. And I think they're really good. And I don't usually say that about my own work, but <clears throat> other people say so too. Like Hetty has read them both and she says that they're really good. So, um, so I believe in them and I've been trying to get them published for, for four years and still, you know, just rejection after rejection. So sometimes it just takes a really long time. And uh, I think, I think in terms of being afraid, uh, I have definitely been afraid to submit things. Um, and I would encourage you to, to, I don't want to say get over that, but definitely, you know, go against that, face that fear and overcome it because it's worth it. I can tell you that my most recent experience with that, uh, I had an essay that I, that I pitched to someone um, kind of as a reflex and it was based on some current events and I just had this idea and I, I pitched it and I got a response back like within 15 minutes saying, yeah, that sounds great. And that immediately put the deadline on me because it was, it, was, um, it was timely, it was a current event thing. So I had to get this done in a couple of days. And I was so afraid of what was gonna happen to me once people started reading this thing. Um, and like legitimately terrified to the point where the first line of the essay is, I'm terrified to write this. So, but I did it anyway, it, it felt important and I pushed myself to do it. And the response was overwhelmingly positive and I got a lot out of it. So you never know. And um, it pays to be brave, especially when you're a writer. So I would encourage that. Uh, for me, particularly, I don't think I was ever scared or fearful of publishing a certain piece. I think it was just fearful of publishing overall because of the nature of the work of memoir writing. You're writing about your life. You're writing about your family members. You, It's so personal and so close. And in the beginning, you know, most often magazines and different publications will ask you to keep the names of people that you're writing about and they don't ask you to change it. And it's a really horrifying thing at first. But, you know, I think once you realize that you've written your story, you're happy with it, you're happy with the truth of, you know, what it is, uh, when you take that first step, the first piece is always horrifying because your first rejection is always horrifying. And my first time I sent out something, of course, I was rejected the second, third. I think I use Submittable to track all of my publications. And, like, it's just, like, a list of, like, rejected. And... <laughs> Every now and then I go in there and I'm like, all right, I need to not look at this for a little bit and then I'll go back in and start doing it again. But I think publishing overall, there's just a lot of fear involved with it because it's, you know, it's just the nature of the writing. Thank you so much for answering that question. A bit of a follow-up to it from Crystal. What is the submission process like? How did you start? Uh, well, there's a couple of different submission processes. I think um, for what I'm talking about, it's generally going to be online, um, not print. Uh, that's a very different process. Um, there's also a lot of different like contests and there's so many different things you can enter into. I think for me, I just started Googling. One, it's word of mouth. So some people will be nice and they'll send you things. They'll send you, you know, open um you know, open submissions, all that. Um, other, it's just Google. I really just used Google. <laughs> um, and um, and having a submittable, I think almost every place uses that now. Um, I will say that in the beginning, and I think even now, I'm sometimes a little wary about paying a certain amount um, to submit my piece. So if there is a price associated with it, I have to check out and make sure, you know, Look at the submission guidelines, look at the place, make sure, you know, I, I know what the money is going towards. Um, but um, yeah, for me, it was really not scientific at all. It was Google. And then reading what they had published, seeing if I could find something that fit. Sometimes I just did a shot in the dark. Um, and that was pretty much it. I used to do it like honestly all at once. It was like applying to jobs. I would just keep sending, sending, sending and do it in bulk. 
And then I would, I would like wear myself out and stop. <laughs> um, but it was like Natasha, you just, you know, you, you sometimes get a hit. And then honestly, I have to say it's, it's a lot of rejection, um, but you also are putting yourself out there. So you are going to be rejected. It is a lot like applying to a job. <laughs> I agree. It's, it's very much like that. And a lot of the pitfalls are the same. Um, but I think this is a great time to point out how important um, having a community is because the vast majority of the places where I've been published have been places where I've seen friends of mine published. And so they kind of do the work for you in a way. Um, you know, if, if a friend of mine submitted a poem somewhere, I'll check it out and then I'll just click on their submission guidelines and see what's going on there. And um, I, I think surrounding yourself or, or keeping, keeping a close network of people whose writing you admire, who's, who you can learn from, um, allows you to create this thing where you are, you're all kind of growing together and you're all kind of reaching together. And so if somebody hits, that's kind of a hit for you because now you've seen this open window that you can try getting into. Um, so I would, I would recommend very highly that, you know, Create, create a kind of circle of, of friends for your writing. You know, you all have this same interest. You all have this same compulsion of wanting to get things down on paper. Um, bond over that, connect over that, and share resources. It's, I think um, the scarcity mindset should be completely gone from your mind. There's no, there's no scarcity. There is an overwhelming abundance of places where you can submit work and no one can write the way you write. So it doesn't matter even if two people are writing about the same topic, it's not gonna be the same. So there's no real worry about competing and being neck and neck with somebody else. Um, so help each other out. And if you have a resource, share that. I don't think I can add to that. That was perfectly summed up, guys. Okay, so we have another question from Percy. How do you know when a piece is ready to publish? How do you decide where to send your work to publish? I know we talked a little bit about that, but I think it's worth having another discussion about it. Can I say that I never know when a piece is ready to publish? Because I will keep working on it if, you know, I won't let go of it. <laughs> It's really difficult. One of the things that's really helped is that I do have a writing partner and, you know, I will send my work and I'll get, you know, responses from my community. It's so important to have a community of writers and it really helps with you, you know, looking at your piece and being like, okay, even though I can fix, you know, 10 million things on it, I'm going to put it out into the world because I have been working on it and I have put in all of this effort and time. So I think it's really, it's really just about learning how to let go. But it's also learning that, you know, at, it's a process. You have to put your editor's cap on and you have to make sure that you've done your best because you don't want to send out pieces to publishers that are unedited and that are really, you know, not your best work or the best that you have. So it's really a delicate balance. And I think every person finds it for themselves and really a community really helps with that. I agree. I think it also depends on the publications. Sometimes they have editors and they're going to put it through that filter no matter what you submit to them. That doesn't mean you should submit something you don't think is ready. But um, I've found that helpful lately in the last few things that I've published. There's There's been somebody that I can bounce off of and they're going to give me a chance to look it over again. Um, as for preparing for pieces where you need to just submit it and it needs to be basically ready. The thing that I've found that I have to do, even though I can't stand it, is I have to wait. I have to finish the piece and put it away and just, you know, leave it for two weeks. Because if I don't, then I'm still the writer trying to be the editor and I just can't do it. Um, so that's why it's helpful to have somebody else. Like I'll just, I'll just email it to my friend Crystal. We we share we share writing all the time, Crystal Satal, and um, I send it to her. And immediately, what happens is the minute I send it to her, I look it over again and I 
tweak a bunch of stuff and I go, okay, don't read that one, read this one. And I send her another, another draft. Um, so my brain just can't stop. So I have to create a rule for myself where I send it and I just wait and I have to do something else. Um, and if I can't, if I can't um, have someone else read it, I have to become that someone else by giving myself time away from it. There are a lot of pieces that I've written and even pieces that I've published where I don't look at it for a while after it's published. You know, there's that excitement when it's published, you share it, you think it's great. I don't look at it for six months or something and I click on it again and I'm like, oh God, why did it? No, I need to fix that. And I can't. Um, and it's because I didn't wait. So patience is key. Yeah. Um, so I would say that for my long form pieces, I definitely struggle to publish those at all. Um, there's something about them that always feels, to, at least to me, like they're always in, in the editing process. Um, I, I have to, that's something I'm still learning is how, how to publish long form work, poetry and um, hundred words, short, shorter works. That's a lot easier for me. And I don't know if it's because I find it more fun. So the idea of publishing it is not as, um, it's not as stressful or high stakes to me. It's just like, eh, I'm just going to throw this out there anywhere. Um, let's see what happens with it. Um, but long form is definitely for me the most difficult one. And that's, that's what I'm still working on. I will say that definitely having a solid writing partner who you can send it to for a review is key. Um, that's, that's been the most helpful is just having someone else other than yourself to be the reader um, for you and, um, and help you out in that regard. Can I also add, because Eddie has been always natural reader has been one of the best resources <laughs> and I'm even using it you know for my journalism writing now but just being able to hear your words uh reflected back to you is so helpful so you know in the editing process listen to Eddie she knows what she's talking about it's still on my computer uh, tell everybody what that is I don't think I know what it is oh so natural reader is like this free um I don't even know. I, I can't even say it's an app. No, it's not an app. It's, an, it's, it's a program. An it's an app. Yes, it's an app. Okay, yeah. So it's a program that you can copy and paste your written words into it, and it'll read it back. It's a very robotic voice, but you get used to it, and it's incredibly helpful to hear your words repeated back to you, to see where the flow, you know, just doesn't sound right. It's during the editing process, it's been one of the most helpful things to me that I think I've ever um, used. And I continue to use it since Eddie told me about it when I was in her memoir program to now. Well, it's been that long. <laughs> uh, I still use Natural Reader. And I think, you know, Natasha is absolutely right because even when we read aloud, uh, we, we kind of uh, give uh, to the writing the intonation and the rhythm that we would like to hear it. And the, the aseptic computer voice is merciless. Um, and you don't need to cut and paste actually, Natasha. So I have, you can actually download it through your phone from Dropbox. You just open your Dropbox oh. and whatever file, file you have, you can just open it and it reads it from there. You know, I'm going to write on chat what it is so people can look for it. I have to just point out for one second that this is a monumental moment. Eddie Junta just gave someone else tech advice. That's incredible. Like, absolutely incredible. <laughs> so, we have another question. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Yomalis, um, what are query letters? How are they written? And what is the significance of having agents for your work? Angel, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at you because I, I'm like. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't have, I don't have an agent and I don't think I've ever written a query letter. Um, yeah, I, I've seen a few. Have you seen them that Saeed show you any like query letters? <laughs> I've seen yeah. them. So Natasha and I both went to Hunter College for uh, creative writing, and um, Saeed Sarafazadeh, he is he was one of our craft teachers, and he's very into the publishing aspect and actually trying to get us um, prepared for that 
side of everything. So he did have us do exercises and he did have us um, check out, you know, agents and things like that. But honestly, I haven't gotten there yet. It's not, um, I'm not on any agent's radar and uh, I haven't been on it. I haven't been on a search for an agent. So I can't really speak to that, but um, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I I'm sorry, um, I can't answer it. All I know from my from working in publishing is, I I think too like the terminology. There's so many different ways to call it. Like for there's so many different words for the same thing. So for us, we always just saw it as a proposal. So I'm assuming the query letter is what you send to your agent when you want them to pick up your book. But um, you know there are. I would have to say that if you are at that point where you think you want to submit um, a book length. Um, you want to start sending out your book and your manuscript to agents, then you would probably, I would recommend taking a class on it. Um, they're really great resources and they will get you ready. Um, I've mentioned this before, but Catapult has really great online classes that are geared toward, um, you know, getting your, your book ready for publication and finding agents because they have, um, uh, like most, you know, um, master's programs and stuff, they have actual writers teaching those classes. So they they know and they all talk to each other. Um, they have a great community there. So if you're looking into that, um, I definitely recommend going to Catapult. Like uh, like Angel, I am not there yet. So I, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like I'm going to like, you look into it when you're ready for it. Um, until then, you just keep working. And um, yeah, so that's that's my advice on that. Check out Catapult. <laughs> Yeah, no, Chloe, you're definitely right. You know, when I was looking into query letters, um, one thing that I came across is that query letters tend to go hand in hand with book proposals. And book proposals can, mind you, be like, I think it could be like 40 to 50 pages, depending on like the kind of work that needs to go in there, which includes your sample work as well. But so I think if you really, um, if you really think you are in that direction, that you really do need to check out other resources because it's not as simple as just writing a query letter and submitting it to an agent because chances are, are they'll ask you for a follow-up with a book proposal or like, you know, what work do you have prepared? And as a writer, they tell you, especially as a memoir writer, to be as prepared as you can for when, you know, those opportunities arise because if they do happen and you don't have that kind of stuff, it might just really not end favorably for you. Yeah, um, to follow up with that, we do have another question. Um, it's from Leo. What is your process when you are considering submitting work? How does a writer go about choosing which works they will like to they would like to submit? Um, okay. <laughs> Every time I hear a long moment of silence, I'm just like, unmute. Um, so the question's about choosing which works that you want to submit, correct? Okay. Uh, for me, um, I think sometimes I do look into the place first and then pick my piece based on where I'd like to submit it. I think other times I have a piece in mind that I want to go find at home. So I will... Um, Sometimes, you know, asking people is, is really helpful to see where you would like to submit that piece. But, um, uh, you know, I, th I put it in the chat box. If you look at like writers and whose style is that you think similar to yours or that you admire, sometimes just looking at their bio and seeing where they've been published is really helpful to figure out where you would like to be published. Um, this is works especially really well for like the smaller authors that you might have um, follow. So like poets or, or somebody who, who's not so, you know, big, like a, like a commercial author, you don't want to look at their stuff. Um, <laughs> but um, as like for picking, I don't know, it's just like, each, I think it's one of, for me, it's become one of those things where I just know that I want to, to go for it. Um, it's just, I feel like the piece is worth my time and effort to try to get it published. Cause that's the other thing you have to, your, your time and your, and your and energy, you know, you got to think of it as um, an expense and it's something that you want to, um, you know, 
you want to spend. <laughs> I definitely agree with Chloe. I think I tend to, you know, have my piece ready. When I think it's publishable, I will go to Submittable or, you know, go to Google and be like, where's the best 10 to 20 places to get published? Or like, you know, just honestly, just using the search engine to find all of the resources. The internet has everything out there. And there are so many places to publish and I feel like you're always gonna find, it takes time, like Chloe said, and you have to be willing to spend that time, but you will be published if you believe that your piece, you know, is something that's worth be, being out there. I think it just takes time to find that place. You know, Angel said that he's had a piece for four years. I've had a piece that I've been trying to place for the last couple of years, and I'm not giving up on it. I think it's just about finding the perfect home for it, and it will happen eventually. It's just, it depends on the time that I, invest on making that possible because you know with so many different publications it just means that you know I have to keep sending it out and I have to keep getting rejected and waiting and submitting um I think I'm in a binders group and recently someone said that after like 10 years you know they've had this piece that they've been holding on to for 10 years and it finally got published and sometimes it really just takes that long um, so I think there's like no set date, no set time. It really just depends on what you're willing to invest into it. Yeah, an important thing to add there, I think, is that it's not just the publication, right? It's who at that publication is reading your submission. And if, you know, it could be a million reasons why they decide to say no um, or why they decide to say yes, you know? So, um, just because it gets rejected doesn't mean that it's not a, it's not necessarily a good fit for the publication even. Um, but you know, you might have to just wait till someone else is handling the reading. Um, because really people are just going by their own tastes. Like they have an idea of the type of stuff that that publication leans toward, but it's also just at that person's discretion, you know? So they might read it and not quite get where you're coming from or not quite get where you're, what you're trying to do, but someone else might, the next person might. So just keep trying. You know, speaking on that, you, the piece that I published that, you know, Eddie taught in her class, it was rejected by Narratively, but then Roxanne Gay's magazine picked it up and, you know, they said yes to it, I think within the same month. So I think it really, again, like Angel said, it really is just a matter of finding the right place and submitting. And it really depends on who's reading it and what they're looking for at that time. So it doesn't mean that your work's not good or it doesn't deserve to be published. It's just, there's so many different variables that goes into why it will or will not get published that you can't really pinpoint it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Donia, for just um, selecting some really great uh, questions. Thank you everyone for the questions. And thank you to the three of you for this uh, uh, accumulated writing wisdom. It's been so interesting um, to listen to you. And I, I know that many of, so many of the people who are here um, will find uh, um, your experience and, and suggestion invaluable. And I'm taking notes. So we have had one first NGSU Writers Workshop on uh, on uh, um, submitting to literary magazine. We're gonna do something on agents uh, and as well as other aspects of the writing uh, um, experience. So keep uh, those questions coming. And uh, if we know what events uh, you want, we can create uh, those events, we can, we can make them happen. And um, I want to close uh, announcing, this, was, this is the last, as I said, of our writers event for this semester. But we are already working uh, um, with the NGSU Center for the Arts uh, um, on a series of other exciting writers events. And one is already scheduled, is the, um, uh, the seventh annual 100 Word Reading Marathon. And um, some of you know what the 100 Word group is, uh, and some of you don't. So um, I think uh, all three of you have been or are in 100 Word uh, groups and I was wondering if you could very quickly tell us, tell the audience about uh, what the group is and why it's a good reason to join or create one. Uh, 
Uh, for, for me, I, I think it's constantly hearing different voices um, and reading different voices and then um, having a built-in writer's community um, and also helps you keep steady practice. Okay. I agree. For me also, it was um, your group should be very strict about the hundred word thing. It should be no more, no less. Um, and I always took that very seriously so that it would help me be a sharper editor. You don't realize it until you start having to really work in this confined space, how, how efficient you can be with language, how few words you actually need to tell a whole story or to give a full image. Um, so I, I really love it for that reason. Yeah, I think Angel is definitely correct. I think clarity and you know, being able to write specifically is one of the most difficult things because when you have space to explore, you will write and write and write. And, you know, it's really great to get all of that out. But when it comes to editing, just having that very limited word space to try to get across your thoughts, it's, um, it's really great uh, for practicing just how to sharpen your work. And on top of that, I think um, a lot of pieces that I've written have come out of 100 word groups. If I'm not lying, I think the, the piece that I published actually started off as 100 words and eventually I expanded on it. And, you know, I started exploring what was happening within this piece and it ended up becoming something that was, that I thought was really great that I'd never actually thought about writing. And I think that's the one thing about the 100 words that I really love. You don't really go into it necessarily knowing what you're going to write about because you're pulling from someone else's work. And it gives you the opportunity to sort of explore the unconscious parts of things that you haven't necessarily said that this is what I'm going to write about. I'm going to write about, you know, family or love or whatever it is. But I think it, it, it's really just a great space and it's a really great community because having that community um, is really, really important. And I think if you don't want to commit to a large community, you know, the 100 words is a nice way to keep your writing practice up and to have a community. And, you know, it's not really too much of a crazy commitment. It's one, once a week, 100 words, and I think everyone can do it. I agree. Uh, I, I, um, I found it to be this incredible commitment in the beginning. Like, oh, okay, I'm gonna have to do this every week. And it's the silliest thing. It's 100 words once a week like anybody can handle that right um but then i started getting addicted to it and i and i became obsessed where to the point where i was in five groups i think for four years and i loved it because because another thing that it did was foster this discipline that you need as a writer you need to keep writing you need to not slack off it's like going to the gym if you don't go to the gym you're not going to get fit you know that six pack is not going to come out of nowhere so it's, it was, you know, it was a way to keep myself on the ball because every time that I was, you know, if I came home and it was super late and I hadn't done it yet, I would just be like through one bloodshot eye, just like doing something because I felt like I was letting down these six other people by breaking the chain and I didn't want to do that. Um, so it really helps with discipline. Thank you so much. And uh, um, Angel, I was in six groups, so I win. As usual, Eddie wins. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just on fire, in fire right now. And in any case, if you are already in a 100 word group, please mark your calendar and come and read your words at our reading marathon. If you are not, come to this event and we'll get people connected so they can start their own 100 word writing group. It's a fantastic experience. And uh, in times of social isolation, it's actually the perfect uh, um, writing group. Thank you so much to our writers, uh, Angel, Natasha, Coy, you are spectacular. Thank you, Donia, that were, you were wonderful. Um, thank you, um, audience, for your great questions. My students, uh, I hope uh, that you feel inspired and motivated. And Stephanie, thank you for the center's uh, support. Uh, and sponsoring of events uh, uh, like this. Thank you so very much. Oh my goodness, Eddie, Chloe, Angel, Natasha, Donia. Our hearts are hugely open. And Angel, you said something that I'm going to scroll on my wall. It pays to be brave. 
Um, so you inspired us to be brave and I thank you so very much. Uh, I also wanna thank Anna Carhart, our theater manager, Justin Tinker, technical director, and Sabrina Sabalo, our box office manager and Zoom coordinator for making this all happen. Thank you so much. And please stay tuned, njcu.edu slash arts for our upcoming events. Um, in addition to the 100 Word Marathon, we've got a lot of writers events coming and music events coming for the spring. So please join us. And I hope you have a wonderful evening.